This week on Vice, Europe's exploding refugee crisis. There is no shelter, no living conditions. In fact, there is nothing. We're here on the Turkish side of the border, but just right across there, you can see Tal Abyad, which is still under ISIS's control. And then the geopolitical consequences of the recent terrorist attacks in Paris. We're right in front of Notre Dame, and this is really the first big vigil since the shooting just a couple days ago. I saw the sign here. It says, say no to Syrian refugees. The less of them in this country, the better. Spiraling violence caused by the civil war in Syria has touched off the worst refugee crisis since World War II. Fully 4.5 million Syrians have fled, with many headed towards the safety of Europe. We follow some of these refugees on their perilous trail of modern migration. We're here on the Turkish side of the border. People here are safe going about their day-to-day -day lives. But just right across there, you can see Tal Abyad, which is still under ISIS's control. It has been for well over a year now. They've been gathering there for days, waiting to cross into Turkey, hoping to escape the war and, and the Islamic State. We talked to one family that managed to make it across safely. يعني كانت دائما في دائما في قذائف دائما في اشتباك بنقطع كان في حالة اشتباك ويعني نحن اضطرينا هيك ننبطح بالأرض حتى ما يصير نحن كان قناص عم يضرب وكان في اشتباك مع بعض ثلاث ساعات بقينا نحن هنيك على الأنين متخبين مشان لحد ما وقف الاشتباك وقدرنا نقطع ال كانت موت بأي لحظة. Turkey shares Syria's entire northern border. And it struggled to deal with the more than 2.5 million refugees who've crossed over so far. We're here just a couple of kilometers away from Syria. This is Turkey's largest refugee camp. There are over 25,000 people here. Camps like this one were only meant to be a temporary solution. But the endless violence in Syria means that most of these refugees will never be able to go home. <laughs> صرنا يعني عشر تشهر بنا هني ما ضل عنا مصاري في نحنا أولادنا شوفوا عندهم مرض أخذتونا على المشفى ما قابلونا بداية كل كل يوم كل يوم ألف موتي والله. People are so desperate to get out of these camps that many of them set their sights on the European Union, which they see as their best chance for a better life. Last year, more than 800,000 refugees tried to get to Europe by making a dangerous boat trip to the closest Greek islands. And across the Mediterranean, more than 3,700 people drowned. We talked to one Syrian refugee who was preparing to make the crossing. Musa hoped to join his brother Ammar, who'd already made it to Greece. <laughs> طريقة أنا طلعت إلى تركيا لأنه النظام كان أخذ كل شو اسمه السابيدة لأنه بنعرف نحن راح يجوا يأخذوني بداله إنه ما بدي أقتل حدا <تصفيق> مش إنه ما بدك تموت ما بدك أنت تقتل ما بدي أقتل أنا يعني هلا تموت شغلة لحالة وتقتل شغلة لحالة أنت خايف لحالة يعني أقول خايف كمان يعني أول مو خايف كمان عم بجذب عليك يعني ما في حدا ما بخاف لأنه توت أو كيم والباب أوروبا طلع على أوروبا بس أنت بتمر بالموت لحتى تصل لأوروبا. Smugglers have turned this journey into a billion dollar business, and Musa had to pay about a thousand dollars to secure his place. I went with him as he negotiated the deal. Saudi, 
مالار خاله با مسمات هی عیل حکیم با قال بکن راکب صاحب صحیح و راحت مسافر. اون مسکی و عت حرق میل جمیش ماله. ما اختراع تیارات. That night, as other refugees lined the streets to make the same journey, Musa was picked up by a smuggler and given some frightening instructions. The reason they sink their own boat in Greek waters is because under a UN resolution, the Greek Coast Guard would be forced to rescue the passengers and bring them to the EU. But before they made it to the Greek side, the boat started sinking on its own. After hours of drifted sea, the refugees were spotted by the Turkish Coast Guard and taken back to Turkey. To better understand what's driving this mass migration, we spoke to one of the top policymakers dealing with the crisis, Antonio Guterres who until January was the UN's High Commissioner for Refugees. It's clear that the, the mega crisis in Syria and Iraq became the worst humanitarian uh, situation since the Second World War. It's a, a catastrophic situation. People said, well, we are doomed here. And so uh, the movement uh, uh, into uh, Europe accelerated. I remember talking to the refugees in the beginning. They were saying, well, soon we'll go back home. We are sure we'll go back home. And then. Slowly, slowly, this hope uh, has been vanishing uh, as they don't see light at the end of the tunnel. With no hope of returning to Syria, more and more refugees are arriving in Greece each day. These refugees may have made it to Europe, but for many of them, the conditions here are actually worse. It's become so desperate that abandoned hotels have become makeshift shelters. How very well documented what needs to be done here. Huh? It's not rocket science. Here we're talking for elementary, basic living conditions for these people. And there's nothing here in place. Huh? There is no provision of uh, water, there is no shelter, no living conditions, no toilets. In fact, there is nothing. Greece has been, in the last uh, few years, a very difficult economic situation. They have levels of unemployment that are appalling. Greece is less prepared to be able to properly uh, receive and accept uh, this population. One refugee who's learned that lesson the hard way is Musa's brother Ahmad, who left Syria a few months before him. He's been stuck here in limbo for almost a year. <laughs> So are you scared to try again? Ammar joined hundreds of other refugees on a train headed north toward the Macedonian border and one step closer to Germany. At Policastro, they continued on foot. <laughs> Ammar split from the group, and after walking for two straight days, he crossed safely into Macedonia. But those he left behind weren't so lucky. Finally, we get to the border, and there are hundreds of refugees waiting to cross. 
Right, this is on the Greek side of the border, and just along the way you see the Macedonian army. Uh, they've tried to cross several times, and every time they cross, they get there. And whether or not the Macedonian army actually pushes them back forcefully, they find themselves back here because the border is closed. Just a few days later, tensions here exploded. And across Europe, refugees overwhelmed border security by the thousands. At the same time, Germany said it would accept more asylum seekers. So individual countries began sealing their borders and shuttling refugees towards Germany by train. <laughs> when you talk to some of these refugees, when you ask them questions, they end up asking you as many questions as you're asking them because they don't have any idea where they're going really or what they're going to do when they get there. But tensions have been mounting. After the terrorist attacks in Paris, Central European countries began severely restricting who could pass through their borders. New rules in the wake of the Paris attacks. Serbia, Macedonia, Croatia, and Slovenia announced they will turn back economic migrants Outraged refugees staged a gruesome demonstration in response, sewing their lips together in protest. And those who have made it through have found that even Germany is overwhelmed by the crisis. This is the bridge connecting Austria and Germany. You can see tons of refugees waiting here to cross over. And even though this is hopefully the end of their journey, they're still waiting. <laughs> But even inside Germany, there are hundreds of thousands of refugees already waiting. In fact, in 2015, one million refugees fled to Europe, an influx that no country could handle alone and the arrival of so many foreigners in Germany has sparked a growing backlash. Thousands marched in Dresden in support of the anti-Islam movement Pegida. They're part of a movement protesting what they see as the threat to German culture. Bisher verfolgten sie eine Salami Taktik, uns unser Land scheibchenweise wegzunehmen, demografisch durch kontinuierliche Masseneinwanderung. Meanwhile, after thousands of miles and countless border crossings, Ammar's year-long journey had finally come to an end in a small city in Germany. But he told us that being accepted into Europe doesn't mean being accepted by the people who live here. The war in Syria and the exodus it's causing is just one of dozens of conflicts that have created a staggering 60 million displaced people around the world. A profound crisis that is already reshaping the political landscape in Europe and even in the United States. You can't even believe it. If things continue this way, what does the future hold? I think many decision makers in the world refuse to see the reality that is coming until that reality enters their doors. We have seen a multiplication of new conflicts. In the past, we had wars between states or between a government and a rebel group. But now, in many countries, you have a multiplicity of actors. You have uh, government forces, international forces, ethnic militias, religious militias, uh, political militias, all operating in the same scenarios. And all the conflicts are getting interlinked, from Nigeria to Afghanistan. You see fighters going from one scenario to another. It shows how the world is changing, how it's becoming much more dangerous, and how much more people are suffering. And we are also seeing eruptions of xenophobia. And when, for instance, someone says in Europe that Muslim refugees are not welcome, it gives a pretext for the propaganda that Daesh makes about the attitude of the Western world in relation to the Muslim world. This cannot go on. If this goes on, everybody will be threatened.
Now, the flood of refugees coming out of Syria has been one of the largest humanitarian crises of our modern age. But the global response to it transformed overnight due to suspicions that a member of the ISIS attacks in Paris may have entered the country posing as a refugee, which has sparked a number of complex and contradictory reactions around the world. We're right in front of Notre Dame, and this is really the first big vigil since the shooting just a couple days ago. And hundreds of people have come out here. There are still gunmen on the loose that they haven't located. Everyone seems to be still very much on edge. Frères et sœurs, il y a maintenant 48 heures, Paris a vécu une des périodes les plus critiques de son histoire. Des hommes et des femmes ont été sauvagement exécutés. In November of 2015, ISIS claimed responsibility for one of the deadliest terrorist attacks committed in the West since 9-11. Armed gunmen and suicide bombers, including at least two rumored to have entered the EU posing as refugees, stormed the city of Paris, terrorizing innocent civilians in a concert hall, a stadium, and restaurants, killing 130 people. These memorials with hundreds of people putting candles and flowers down are all over the city. Les actes commis vendredi soir à Paris et près du Stade de France sont des actes de guerre. La Syrie est devenue la plus grande fabrique de terroristes que le monde ait connue. Il faut plus de frappes. Nous en faisons. Immediately after the attacks, France began dramatically stepping up its airstrikes against ISIS targets in Iraq and Syria. But airstrikes tend to go hand in hand with the surge in anti Muslim rhetoric. It helps to prove ISIS's contention that the West is at war with Islam, which in turn helps to radicalize disaffected Muslims and inspire new attacks. De la part de vos frères qui ont immigré, vos frères français, qu'attendez-vous? It's a cycle that we don't seem to be able to break, and now it's playing out here in the United States. Shooter says no, I shot fired. And the shooter's supposed to be in a parking lot with a machine gun. Several down, several medically. We have at least 20 victims. A married couple opened fire at the Inland Regional Center in San Bernardino. Evidence is mounting that the killers in San Bernardino, California, had become homegrown Islamist radicals. The killings, coming so soon after the Paris attacks, set off a call to seal our borders, even though the attackers were not refugees. It is lunacy to be bringing refugees into this country who may be terrorists trying to murder Americans. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. That focus on refugees has taken root, and more than 30 governors have called for a block on Syrian refugees, in spite of President Obama's pledge to take 10,000 more. And across the U.S., reported hate crimes against Muslims tripled in the month following the Paris attacks. In Dallas, civilians are organizing armed protests and defending against what they see as a threat to their communities. So we're here with the groups outside of Dallas, and they're just prepping for a protest that they're going to do in front of a mosque next weekend. Let's go ahead and, and go back over some weapon safety, make sure everybody's got an empty chamber. Good hook. Safe. All right, good to go. Sweet. We're going to be the first stage. So if someone tries to break in the line, go ahead and close up like that, because they're going to be expecting us this time. Inside the mosque, we watched as the imam prepared his congregants. Tomorrow, I'm sure most of you are aware that there's going to be a rally outside of our mosque, and that it's going to be a group of armed people. Our part is to make sure that what we're doing is correct. 
As the mosque braced for this protest, the broader religious community held a tense meeting about how to respond. I am deeply concerned when Muslims are harassed. I can't fathom. Wes, can you fathom people with guns outside your church on Sunday? I mean, it, it's outrageous. When I hear a presidential candidate say it's a good idea to register and label people, that has echoes for me of 1930s Germany. Think about my grandfather, who was a social activist amongst many things, and one night was visited by the Klan to his home. And my grandfather invited the Grand Wizard in for coffee. He wanted him to know that, yes, you can show up at my door, but you're not going to cause me to run away. In moments like this, you can't remain silent. And I think people are being challenged to determine what side of history they are going to stand on. I saw the sign here, it says, say no to Syrian refugees. Do you also back that message? Absolutely. The less of them in this country, the better. How does it feel to be a former US Marine and a part of the Muslim community and having these guys come up here saying, basically, you're un-American, and if you're Muslim, there's a good chance that you're a terrorist? They're seeing in the media is not the Islam that I know. I think they teach this in the military when you go to combat, you dehumanize your enemy so it makes it easier to kill them. And that's what all this is rolling up to be, an attempt to dehumanize Muslims, make them seem that they're not American, like they don't belong, when they have every right just like any other American. If a Syrian refugee came in here and killed your kid, you'd be over here with me. Neither one of those people are Syrian refugees in San Bernardino. That's not the point. The point That's is... That's the point just made. You said no, you're Syrian No, the point is, is that ISIS is mixing in with Syrian refugees. That's a fact. So do you attend this mosque here? Yes. OK. Yes, and what do you make of the protests here? In a way, I don't blame these people. Most of these people, they misunderstand. Islam is not about killing people. Islam, Islam is not about hate. OK, Islam is about love, peace. What ISIS is doing, unfortunately, us here, Muslim in America, we are suffering behind that. Yeah. My wife get harassed at work because of what she's wearing. Um, my son, he got jumped in the gym. Ahmed, what would you want to tell somebody who, who bullies you or who doesn't understand your religion? Just think before they do what they do and say what they say, because we're not all bad. Usually, you drive past a protest like this, you see guys with big guns, and you sort of think, oh, they're just crazy extremists. But now that you have governors and senators, presidential candidates coming out and speaking the same message, they actually don't seem that fringe anymore. Around the same time, the governor of Texas announced that he would attempt to block all Syrian refugees from entering his state. Syrian refugees uh, are not going to be allowed into the state of Texas and given refuge. Despite the governor's proposed block, one family was able to beat the odds. We met up with them during their very first hours in Texas as they reunited with their family. <laughs> Fayez came to America 10 months ago. Now, after two years apart, his brother, nephew, and their families have arrived safely. Most Americans have no idea what you've been through. How do you raise a family in a place like Syria the way it is right now? أول إشي عندك الخوف من من كل الأنواع ممكن من أي شيء ممكن يصير إلك. ما ما في يعني ممكن أي ساعة تيجي قذي في تهاوي أي ساعة ممكن طيران يطلع لك صف. شفنا إن أهل أقارب رصاص صاب هون. بنت أخوي عمرها صبية عمرها 28 سنة طلقة براسها هاي هاي واقع. The U.S. traditionally accepts more refugees than any other country, but when it comes to Syrian refugees like this family, the opposite is true. While other countries have admitted hundreds of thousands of displaced Syrians, the U.S. have accepted about 4,000 since the war began. But some lawmakers here think even that is too many. We also need to do everything we can to block terrorist pathways into our country. Congressman Michael McCall, who fought to keep this Syrian family from settling in Texas, introduced legislation that would all but block more refugees from Syria and Iraq. 
The system as it is now, in order for somebody to get through our refugee program, first of all, less than 1% chance they'll get past the first stage with UNHCR. They then are investigated, interviewed by multiple U.S. agencies. That's the FBI, DHS, State Department, um, counterterrorism unit, intelligence community. It's not an easy process. It can take up to two years. Why would ISIS send somebody through that process? Well, uh, that's a good question for ISIS, but we know that they have tried to do it. I know your state was recently embroiled in a debate surrounding whether or not to let Syrian refugee families into Texas. What was your stance on that? I'm hopeful uh, that my bill will pass so that we can, again, put a better um, system in place. And so you didn't want those families accepted until a new vetting process was in place? Well, I, they submitted a, a statement from me that our intelligence services have or a warning that they are trying to exploit it. But the Justice Department came back and called the evidence the state was putting forward uninformed and speculative. Well, I don't want to get into all the ins and outs of that case. That That's a, the state attorney general uh, making his case. I don't know the uh, all the specifics on this family. I understand the security concern, but by hitting the brakes on accepting refugees into our country, are we in some way closing the door to the most vulnerable population in the world? And isn't that sort of the most un-American thing we can be doing? No, I think it's very pro-American to protect American lives. And, and I would argue that uh, until I'm given assurance by the Secretary of Homeland, FBI Director, and Director of National Intelligence that, that these people don't pose a threat to our national security, I'm uh, uncomfortable. If we don't do this right, Americans could die, and that's what we're trying to stop. Congressman McCall's bill passed the House but failed in the Senate, so for now, we won't be closing our doors to refugees. But the rhetoric surrounding this legislation may be aiding terrorist recruitment. Donald Trump's recent comments about barring Muslims from entering the United States are now part of a recruitment video for a terror group affiliated with Al-Qaeda. And the idea that terror groups could seize on this deeply polarized climate to inspire new attacks has American counterterrorism units preparing for the worst. We've seen what happened in San Bernardino. So we're talking about now multiple pronged attacks using heavy weapons and improvised explosives. We spoke to the head of the NYPD's counterterrorism unit, John Miller, about the evolution of the terrorist threat. We're in what's being referred to as a cycle of terror. 9-11 happens, we invade Iraq, ISIS rises, we're now airstriking ISIS. Are we under more of a threat because of how we're reacting to terrorists? You have to take into account that over the last couple of years, between 65 and 85 percent of the killing worldwide in the name of terrorism has been carried out by two groups that didn't even exist before 9-11, ISIL, the Islamic State, and Boko Haram. So the world is getting uh, to be continually a more dangerous place, and that, that's a real challenge. What's the current threat to the U.S. and more specifically New York right now? At any given time, we have three or four major cases going on into long-term threats. And as disturbing as it may sound, is a new normal. That new normal means we're going to be on high alert for the foreseeable future. And the biggest question we face going forward is what to do about the millions of refugees who want protection in the West. It's a huge decision with far-reaching consequences, not just for these families, but for our political process and the fabric of our country.